All right, welcome back to the channel. Uh, I'm sure you came here expecting to see some Challenger 1800 videos, but we decided to drop a uh, winterization and maintenance video first. So in this one, we're gonna be going over how to winterize your jet ski so you can store it over the winter and not worry about freezing. But we're also gonna go over some key maintenance items that you need to keep maintain your ski to make sure that it's perfectly ready for spring and summer. The products needed for the winterization will be RV and marine antifreeze. This is for negative 50, they make negative 75 if you're in colder climates than we are. Uh, we have a anti-corrosive lubricant, which we're gonna spray on the engine, exposed aluminum, and all of our plastics to make sure that everything inside is not gonna be affected by any moisture, if any is still in there over winter. We have a fogging oil, which is going to coat the cylinders in a nice oil glaze so that you don't have surface rust building over winter. And then last but not least, we have stable, which is for the gas. Uh, you put that in there so that the gas does not turn bad on you over spring. This is probably the most important one and we'll show you why now. All right, so as I said, this is probably the most important because you have gas not only sitting in your gas tank, but you have it sitting in your filter up front and you also have it sitting in your carbs. So before you start this to pump winter antifreeze through it or start it to clear it out for winter, whatever you want to do, we're going to put stable in the gas first so that our gas has stable mixed into it. So when you start it, it's going to run on the stables, stabilized gas. So the mixture instructions are right in the back of this, how much to add to it. We have about five gallons, so I did per five gallons, but do it to your discretion because not every tank's gonna be the same, obviously. Um, if you would like to, you can top off your tank. Um, some people say that they top it off because they're worried about moisture or whatever. It's kind of what stable's for, so I'm not gonna be too concerned about it. If you wanna top it off, top it off. There's no harm in it. Um, if you have an empty tank, you're gonna need some type of gas to start this thing so you can winterize it. So at least put a couple gallons in there with, with, with uh, stable in it so that we can proceed with the rest of this process that we're gonna show you. All right, so before we start the ski and winterize it, which is gonna be our final and last start of the season, we're gonna do some maintenance items first. And the reason why I like to do the maintenance items first is because I have my last chance to start it after I've done my maintenance items to make sure I didn't mess anything up. Um, if it starts running like crap, obviously you know you did something wrong or whatever, but there's a couple maintenance items I do first before the last start, which is with the antifreeze. So we'll get into that right now. My first maintenance item is spark plug wire. So this is a new to us ski. Um, we're gonna restore it, but this is the perfect uh, opportunity to show you guys what to do maintenance wise. So this spark plug wires are screwed into the boots over time because there's constantly moisture in here and just aged. I mean, these things are like, what, 25 years old? Um, over time, you'll get like uh, corrosion on your spark plug wires. So just as a maintenance item, we take it out. These look pretty decent, but I'm gonna show you how to do it anyways. You'll see that there's a couple ribs that are on the spark plug wires. The ribs are from the spark plug boot being there so long over time. So I cut between the first rib and the second rib. So I go just a couple, just a couple little, like an eighth of an inch off. You can cut more than that if you want, but the goal here is to when you cut it, you want fresh copper wire. There's no corrosion, there's no missing strands of wire from the old uh, spark plug boot being put on. This is a perfect copper wire that is 100% corrosion free. So now that we have that, we're gonna put the boot back on. We're gonna slide it until it stops. Not too hard, because you don't wanna jam all the wires in there. You wanna be able to screw it on. So now that you have it and it stopped, you're gonna screw it just like you would with anything else. And it'll start getting hard on you. Now you don't over tighten these. So like this is showing resistance right here and, I, and this is moving in my hand a little bit. That's as tight as you want it to go. Your goal here is not crack on it to where you're pulling wires. Cause if you start tightening it more, it'll pull wires and then it will have a bad contact anyways. So make it nice and snug. And then when you're done, finish it up with the zip tie, just how OEM was. Our next maintenance item is our rear box ground. So this is our rear box uh, wire harness that I unplugged. And this is our secondary ground that goes on the battery. So as you can see, I already replaced this because Nick and I were doing maintenance on this and he's like, yo, we should do a maintenance video for everybody. So that's what we're doing. This is the original ground. Okay, you can see how thin it is. It's pretty worn out from being tightened over time. It's, it's kind of elongated, but most importantly, there is green corrosion on the inside of this that down the road is gonna cause a problem. So before it does, replace it now. So we've put a new eyelet on, crimped it down. The only thing I will tell you for advice is that when you actually go to do this make sure that you crimp that you cut as close to your old crimp as possible so that you have plenty of wire to work with because if you don't then it's going to be too short and there's no way to extend this you ruined a harness so cut it as close to the old eyelid as possible 
Just make sure when you look into the wire before you strip it, there's no green corrosion and it's nice and copper. So after we do that rear ground, I always check these grounds, well, the power and the ground to see how the terminals are. These terminals are kind of dirty. Um, you can do two things. You can get a piece of sandpaper and just go like this with sandpaper, or you can get a wire brush and wire brush them. I use my little uh, whiz wheel here. It's got like 320 grit on it, and I just... Clean it up, so it has a nice fresh contact. And since I'm gonna be storing this over winter so that it doesn't get corrosion and stuff on it again, I'll just take dielectric grease between my fingers, pinch it through, and leave the grease on it because we're gonna unhook the battery anyways. So clean it up. Uh, your goal here is not to take metal away, obviously. This is a, a, connector, a connection, so you don't wanna make it thinner or weaker or whatever, but um, you do wanna clean it up so that it is nice and copper like that again. Okay, your next maintenance item is to check these lines. So like I said, this is a new to us ski. Nobody's done these lines before. If you feel them, they're very, very brittle and hard. But more importantly, these are gray lines. And the gray lines over time, because of our ethanol and our fuel, um, these weren't made for ethanol fuel. So when they meet up to the brass part of your carbs, they create like this green goo and it clogs up your carbs. So if you have gray lines, it's winter time, you haven't done it yet, you got months until your things are supposed to be on the water, replace all of the gray lines. Um, take them off one for one, cut them the same length, and put them back on if you've never done it before. It's a very simple job. If you would like, comment below, we could do a video on it, but this is very important. So, if you have gray lines and you're gonna replace them, you should at that point pull the carburetors and rebuild them. We have an incredible DIY, do it yourself, easy as possible, rebuild video on our channel, so check it out. Um, but if you already have gray lines and they've been run and you've never done your carbs, do them now. All right, since we just touched on fuel lines, if you're gonna do fuel lines, or if, even if you've done fuel lines already and you haven't done this, this is your fuel selector, it's up front. This fuel selector is very cheap. It's on OSD Marine for 25 bucks. There are so many problems that can be caused in your ski by this fuel selector going bad. Number one, it can go bad from the green goo that we just talked about, but it can also go bad over time because there's seals inside of this that when you select the fuel, it seals off and creates it to where it goes on reserve, on or off. Over time, if this is from the 96 ski, that seal in there can have a leak to it and it could draw air in from the top and you'll get so many problems and you'll be chasing it down so hard to find it when it was just this. So if you've never done this on your ski and it's original from 90s, replace this. It's 25 bucks, it takes five minutes. We'll put the link for to where to buy this down below. Oh, puppy, it's flirty. Go ahead. Okay. All right, so since we're still on fuel, we'll, we'll cover the last item of the fuel-related maintenance. You should be doing this regardless if you're doing fuel lines or not. You should be doing this every time before you put the ski away. Um, up front, directly underneath here, there is a fuel filter, okay? So you can see in this screen, there's like a couple little chunks on here, but more importantly, there is a bunch of crap in the bottom of the bowl. So this is a plastic filter. Do not clean this with any type of carb cleaner or like acetone or anything. It'll just melt this and then it's garbage. So there's a kit on OSD that we'll link below that comes with the filter and the O-ring. Um, if you don't want to buy the filter and the O-ring, at minimum, you need to replace the O-ring, especially if it's original. The cell ring's probably dried out. Again, could cause air to come in. You have problems, you'll be chasing it down, and this will be the last thing you check, trust me. So, clean this out, clean the bowl out, replace the O-ring, and my advice would be to buy the whole kit and replace this filter, but you can easily clean it and have no issues. So, that for sure needs to be done. Also, if you wanna to start to ski and winterize it first, and then check this, that would also be a good idea, because then, if you pull this, and it's clear gas still, with no stable in it, then you know that you didn't run stable through the carbs and you have to run the engine longer. So that could be a good way to check to make sure that you have stable in the fuel or not, but regardless, clean the filter. Okay, the next maintenance item that I do every single year, no matter what, it's very cheap, 30 bucks. I replace my Ravev bellows. Unless I haven't really ridden it a lot, then I won't replace them. But if you've got a decent amount of hours on here, you don't have to replace them. It's just my OCD kicks in and I replace them. But here's the problem. Everybody always comments on the forms or the pages or whatever that they have like the black oil dripping down, right? It's because your rays are leaking. If you look, this one's starting to leak. Okay, you can see like it's straight up two stroke oil. So if you have not done this, pull these apart, clean your raves, clean the housings, 
buy a bellow kit, keep the springs, make sure you don't lose them because they don't come in a new bellow kit, clean everything out, put new bells on it, and reassemble it. New gaskets, the whole nine. If you've never done this from the 90s, I suggest doing it because perfect operating rave valves are very beneficial to this engine. And if they're getting hung up at all because of carbon buildup or the bellows are, are not strong enough or however you want to put it, then you're going to lose performance. You might not notice the performance when you do it. I'm not saying this is a huge modification. and If you've never done it, you're going to feel it. You probably won't, but at least you'll, your engine will be running perfectly how it's designed. So if you've never done it, now's the time to do it. All right, so the next maintenance item that I like to do is uh, I'll grease the PTO. So the PTO has a boot on it and then the shaft goes into it. Now that shaft length where the actual splines are, it has room to move inside it. That's why you have the uh, rubber boot that has the, the actual bumper boot. Um, but if you don't have grease and all your grease has made its way out of it, um, it will make it to where the shaft doesn't seat properly against the uh, actual carbon seal. So I'm gonna show you how to grease that PTO now to make sure that your drive shaft is properly seated and has enough grease in the boot. All right, so here's your Zerk fitting. If your Zerk fitting is not facing up, you have one of two options. You can bump the starter until it is facing up, or you can take the plugs out and spin it over by hand, but you want this facing up. So you're gonna put your grease gun over this, and then you're gonna wash this boot. So as you can tell, this boot is properly filled with grease. Um, it looks like it's protruding pretty large, but it has flexibility to it, so it's perfectly fine. Most of the time, if they don't have enough grease in them, they will be concaved in towards the front. When you pump this with grease, you're gonna pay attention to two things. Number one, this is a metal clamp. So if you pump this up too much, it'll overflow over to the metal clamp, it'll cut it, and you'll ruin the boot. And the only way to replace this boot is to pull your whole drive pump and the whole drive shaft and everything. So you don't wanna do that if you don't have to. So you're gonna watch it. As you pump it with grease, you're gonna wash your sh both the boot and the shaft. So if this is low on grease, you'll watch the actual drive shaft with the collar for the carbon seal move itself backwards. And then, like I said, you want something to where when you push on with your fingers, this has flexibility and it's not gonna pop, but you don't want it to where you don't have enough in it and you're just like, you're pushing your finger and you can actually feel the drive shaft. So check this. And like I said, when you're filling it, wash the boot and the shaft. All right, so the next item on my maintenance slash checklist would be to check the welch plugs and the exhaust. So the top two aren't really that large of a concern. I've never seen those fail. And this bottom one, just because the pipe will naturally drain itself out, I've never really seen these go, but this bottom welch plug is the one you want to look at. So what I do is I fill up my finger and sometimes you'll feel like a little bit of a bubble. Now it could be two things. It could be the corrosion starting or it could be the paint. So pick it with your nail. And then if you feel like this one, I can pick with my nail. I can feel that there's something definitely going on with it. So you can now feel the exposed metal and it does feel like this one's a candidate for it. So if the welch plug is failing, this is what it'll look like has two spots where, like I said, the exhaust sits like this and the water just sits in there. So over time, it'll just corrode it. But this is a failed welch plug. So what I do is I grind this out and I take my TIG welder and I put a nice bead over the entire thing um, and it's fixed. Some people put um, like marine, what is that shit called? The, JB weld. Yeah, JB weld. They put marine JB weld on here. And I mean, that'll work if it's properly cleaned and whatever, but expansion and contraction with heat, it, it's not gonna keep up and it's gonna fail again over time. It'll just start seeping out around it. So now's the time to do it. It's winter, you're checking all this stuff in freaking October and not when you almost wanna ride. Pull the pipe, do it the right way, grind this out, take it to your local uh, shop and have somebody just put a nice bead over this or uh, OSD sells actual like bungs, like plate covers to where you can grind this whole thing out, put a plate over it and somebody can weld it. But I've been welding it like that for years. I've never had a single issue. So do it the right way. Don't JB weld it, get it welded. All right, so I can't show you on this one because it's been converted to premix, but if you're still using oil injection, which I agree with, I have no gripes with oil injection. I think if it's properly maintained system, you have no issues. Replace the filter. So this is the oil injection filter. It comes from the tank and goes straight to the front of the engine to feed the actual uh, pump itself. If you've never done this, or you're questioning, it's a new ski to you, you don't know if it's done or not, it's just seven bucks and it takes maybe five minutes. So pull the filter, make sure it's facing the correct way. There's an arrow on the filter that shows which way is down. Um, if you don't do it correctly, then you'll never get the air out of it. Um, replace the filter, bleed the system, get all the air out of it, close the bleeder, good to go but definitely replace it if you've never done it. All right, so next on our checklist is check a VTS boot. Now this one's got manual trim, so you're not gonna see a VTS boot in there. However, it should have a VTS boot on it for sure because uh, nothing's keeping the water out of there. So, you know, backyard Brian must have his hand in this one, but 
Here is a VTS boot. Okay, this is a VTS boot. You'll find it in the back of your ski. If you've never done this and your VTS still works, you should, I highly, highly, highly recommend checking this because in between these ridges, they get dried out. Obviously it's a 96. Um, they get dried out and they start cracking. If water comes through this boot and comes through your VTS housing, your VTS housing's trash. A new VTS, if you can find one that's for a 96, you don't have to splice it all together, is gonna cost you like 175 to 225 bucks. So this is a highly recommended maintenance item. This is a full kit from OSD Marine. It comes with finger compression clamps and a new boot. Uh, we'll link it below. But if you've never done this or checked it, definitely check it because this will make your VTS take a shit if water gets inside of it. All right, so the next item on our list is the wear ring. Uh, hopefully you can see in the video, there should be an even amount of clearance between the impeller and the wear ring all the way around. And the gap that you're looking for is something like construction paper. If it's very large to where you can fit like a penny or something in between them, you need to change your wear ring. The other thing is, is that if you're looking through your pump tunnel from the backside, which is where I'm shining the flashlight, you can check pretty much the entire wear ring to see if there's any big gouges or anything out of it. If there's gouges out of it, even with a good clearance, it's gonna cause problems. So you need to change that as well. All right, so the next one jet pump wise on my maintenance list is the oil that's inside of your jet pump. So you're gonna remove that cone, right? And then um, you would just remove the entire bolt system that holds on your nozzle assembly. Um, those are three eight millimeter bolts and it takes 75 weight oil. If you've, I do it every single winter because I'm worried about water coming in over the summer, especially if it's sitting in there on a dock or whatever, you can have water seep in there. I don't want any water in my bearings and I sure as hell don't want it to freeze. So every single winter before I put it away, I change that jet pump oil. It's very easy, it takes maybe 20 minutes and it costs maybe seven bucks. Actually the bottle, the $7 bottle of 75 weight will change that jet pump probably 10 times. So if you're putting it away and you want to do it the right way, change it. Also, if you've ever done it, definitely change it. All right, so now that we've done our maintenance on this ski, we're going to move on to winterization. Like I said before, I do maintenance on it first just to make sure that it runs perfect after I've done all my maintenance. And if you've done that oil filter, then you can make sure all your air is bled out of it. Um, so I'm going to show you how to winterize a ski if you cannot start it, whether you're too lazy to go buy a new battery or you had a catastrophic failure and you're worried about the water sitting in your actual cylinder jugs and possibly cracking, but and you don't want to incur the cost of the cylinders. I'll show you how to winterize it without turning the ski on. Super easy. Um, you're going to take the temperature sensor out. Okay. Now when you take this temperature sensor out, there is a sealant from the factory that is now hard over time. So pull it straight out and then knock the hard sealant away from it because you don't want it landing inside of it. You're next going to take 14 ounces of coolant, your RV coolant. You're going to take a cup, you're going to measure out 14 ounces. Oh man, it looks like freaking Kool-Aid, dude. <laughs> Neon Kool-Aid. Purple drain. This is not, I got some cough syrup if you want to put it in there. Um, so now you're going to take a filter that you, or an oil funnel that you have, right? You're going to put it inside of this hole the best you can. You're definitely going to get something that leaks out of here, so it is what it is. No harm, no foul. And you're going to take your 14 ounces of coolant and you're going to slowly, oh yeah, you're going to slowly pour it down the coolant hole until all 14 ounces is gone. All right, so as you can see, we put that 14 ounces in and it's dripping out of the back of the exhaust, right? This is exactly what you want because here's how this happens. Inside of this exhaust, there's a 90 degree quarter inch fitting. That 90 degree quarter inch fitting comes from the back of this exhaust, goes underneath your engine and comes up to the T that your water drain backs are on your cylinders. So if you're not getting coolant out of the exhaust at this point, after you put 14 ounces of coolant down it, you have sand or other kind of shit blocking those holes. If it doesn't come out, you have to figure out what's going on. Whether you take a mirror and you try to look behind it, whatever. But if you have sand blocking that, you still have water in there. And if you have water in there and you stick this outside, your cylinder jugs are going to expand with the ice, crack, and then next year you're going to take it on the river and wonder why it's filling up with water inside the whole thing. So that's super important if you're not starting the ski. You have to make sure there's coolant coming out of the exhaust. If there's not, you got to find the blockage.
Okay, so really quickly, just to show you how it works if you do not have the engine able to run like we just showed you. So basically you undid your temperature sensor, right? And you're gonna directly put the coolant inside of this, okay? So when you fill this, it'll travel through here, it'll go through this, through into the cylinder where the drain backs are, and then this is not as high as the rest of the head. Obviously, it allows water to come up and over. So that's why I say, it's a safe way to do it if you don't have the ability to run the engine because when you fill this, it'll not only overflow into the uh, inside or the furthest cylinder, right? So this is your PTO cylinder, this is your mag cylinder. So it'll come over this, fill the PTO cylinder, and then it'll keep going through this port and it'll fill the mag cylinder. So once it drops into those chamfers, then you have uh, coolant into the, the passages, that whole water. Water comes down, there's a T here. Right, this is your cylinder drain back and it loops and goes through the hull into the exhaust. All right, so if you've done the winterization without starting it, your next step is to take another 10 to 14 ounces of water of the coolant, take off this rear water box hose clamp and either pour it directly down or funnel, however you gotta do it, but you need to put some type of coolant inside this water box because there is water sitting in there. And if you're sticking this outside, it'll freeze, expand the water box and crack that. So make sure that you have some type of coolant inside that water box if you did not start it and you did it the temperature sensor way. All right, for winterizing your ski, starting it and actually pumping coolant through it, which I would highly recommend. If you have, if you're, have the ability to start the ski, do it this way. We have a 12 volt pump, which literally clamps on your battery and has an on off switch, okay? We have a hose that was like a, probably a six foot hose. I just cut the other end off and it goes straight onto your pump. And then we have your um, adapter so you can push coolant through it. So now on some skis, on the back ride plate that has, or I'm sorry, on the back jet pump plate, there is actually threads in the back of the jet pump plate next to it that has female threads like this that a hose goes straight into it. So if you have a 96, 95, and a couple like 717s, you're gonna need this adapter. Uh, it's on top of the half inch hose. We'll show you how to do it in a second. But on other skis, 96, 97, um, GSX's, RXP's, for whatever you want to do, it has a hose adapter right next on the top left hand side. Yeah, it has to be left hand side because that would be where the VTS is on the right. So left hand side, there's a pipe coming out with uh, female threads. Your hose screws right into there. You don't even need this. So same procedure that we're going to show you right now, but it's just two different models and two different ways of doing it. So you either have this or you screw this to the back right next to your jet pump. Okay, you ready? Yeah. All right, so you're gonna put your fitting on, right? And it's very important. You need to start the ski first before you turn your coolant on. So we're gonna fire the ski up. All right, so for your final step, before you kill the ski, we couldn't show it on camera, just it was way too loud and you wouldn't be able to hear me talking. So you're gonna take your fogging oil, and this one has an R&D filter on it, so it has exposed filter element. While it's running, okay, you're gonna turn your coolant off. Do not shut the ski off with the coolant running. So turn your coolant off, clear out some of the coolant, and the final couple seconds it's running, you're gonna spray your fogging oil like that while it's running, back and forth if you have an open element like this. And then the ski will eventually just die, which is why you saw so much smoke in it. We kind of filmed it first and then we had to start it again. So spray the, the fogging oil back and forth until the ski dies because it's going to suck it in through the intake plates. 
if you have an OEM air box, on top of the air box, there's like a little plug right up here. You're gonna pull the plug out and there's a hole. Just take your uh, fogging oil, stick it right in the hole and spray it while it's running. As soon as it dies, you're done winterizing. You don't need to start it again, you don't need to do anything. If you want, as a proper precaution, to make sure that you have all of the cylinders coated with oil, you can pull your plugs manually, spray the fogging oil down the cylinders, and then with the spark plugs grounded out in the back of your rear box, you can spin the motor over one more time, and when you see fogging oil come out of it, call it good. You're perfectly fine running it and spraying fogging oil until it dies, that's, that's good. But as a precaution, I pull the plugs, spray it down the cylinders one more time, crack it over real quick, put the old plugs back in it, and then call it a day. All right, so now that this is all winterized, it's maintained, we did everything we wanted to do to it, I take my anti-corrosive oil and I spray literally everything. Like the whole engine, all of your exposed um, aluminum, your wires, your box, all your hoses, like everything, you spray us all down. Now the key to this is, is that this is a machine that's in the water all the time, right? It lives in the water, it's the only way you can ride it. So there's gonna be some type of water inside this hull. If you have the seat on, and it's, if it's covered, which most people do, um, you're gonna trap moisture in there. So this is so that the moisture doesn't sit on your parts and corrode them over the four months that it's away. So I always do this. One thing I will say is if you've redone your engine and you use spray paint to paint it, don't spray the engine. It'll turn the spray paint clear coat a really weird color and you'll be very disappointed in it. So do this if you want to, I always do it. Um, in the winter, in the summer, I degrease the whole thing and rinse it all out, make it look nice and shiny again, so it doesn't really affect me. Um, but the only last step to do now is to pull your battery and put it on a trickle charger. All right, guys, I just want to mention one more step uh, after you disconnect the battery, put it on the trickle charger. Obviously, get yourself a sweet cover. Um, depending on if you're storing it indoor or outdoor, you're going to want to make sure you get the proper cover. Also, I like to use, when I store my vehicles, my bikes, either use dryer sheets. You put them you know, under the cover on the inside, or what I like to do is take rags and soak them in peppermint oil. Reason being is because a lot of critters, they hate the smell of peppermint, they won't go anywhere near your shit. Um, so basically, you can put some towels down here in the exhaust um, you know, with peppermint oil, put one in there, maybe under the seat, and then I like to put one on each side of the foot wells, just in case you have an issue with critters. Um, other critters than that, love the turf, dude. Critters, critters love the turf. turf, especially this turf, it's pretty crusty. But um, just wanted to give you guys that pro tip. We hope you enjoyed that video. We know it's pretty detailed, so we hope that you guys will take this as a reference and get your skis stored properly. And as always, we'll see you guys on the next video.